Thank you. <laughs> so Julia is going to give us the word of God. So Lord, I, I thank you for Julia. I thank you for her love for you and her love for your word and um, for serving you in this place, Lord. I just thank you for the gifts that you've given her and I pray that you will use her mightily this morning as she um, opens your word to us. Give her the words to say and our hearts um, to listen, to uh, our ears to listen and our hearts to be open. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeanette. I'm Julia. I'm a member of the congregation uh, here uh, at the Church of the Good Shepherd. Could I have the presentation up, please, Amy? I'm going to um, do the reading as well as the uh, the talk today. Um, uh, COVID has struck, uh, but it makes sense also for me to do the reading. And the reading is from uh, a book in the Bible called Ephesians, um, and it's uh, from chapter 17 uh, through to the end. In fact, I'm just going to whiz over into uh, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 as well. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality and to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learn when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were retort with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of the one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. And do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> is it working? Yay. Amy, can you do it for me? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this, the session this morning um, comes from the book of um, Ephesians. Now, the book of Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul, St. Paul, and he wrote it when he was in prison in Rome. So he'd been to a place called Ephesus, which today is in uh, modern-day Turkey. And some of you might have even been there on holiday and gone on a trip there. Anybody been to Ephesus? Oh, quite a few of you. <laughs> yeah. And there's a picture of it up there. You can see they had one of those wonderful um, uh, colosseums there. And Ephesus um, uh, was an interesting uh, place because there was a mixture of Gentiles and Jews in, in the church um, that Paul had set up in Ephesus. 
Now, today's talk, we're going to talk about a little bit about this a place called Ephesus. We're going to listen and hear some spiritual truths that we need to understand, maybe for the first time, or maybe it's a reminder. And then we're going to have a little practical application about what does that actually mean to us, because it's okay to understand these things, but the important thing is, how do we apply them to our own lives? And last week, Richard um, talked about um, abiding. This session is also about abiding, but from a different perspective. It's a two-part sermon series. And we learned last week that abiding is much more than remaining. It, it's also about following something without objection. Um, it speaks of obedience, of holding fast onto something and following that, remaining stable. Um, and and uh, we, we sung that in our children's song, didn't we? Standing uh, firm. So abiding is not just a case of trying harder. If we did that, we'd have to work at our salvation. And our salvation is a free gift. We don't have to work at it. We don't have to try harder and harder and do better and better. So how, how do we abide then? Uh, and that's what we're going to explore today. So in this place called Ephesus, sorry, go back, I'm not quite ready yet, I'll, I'll shout when we're ready. Um, in this place called Ephesus, um, there were Jews and Gentiles, and unfortunately, um, they had formed factions in the church. Um, there was the Jews and the Gentiles. They came from different cultures, different social classes, and they hadn't really gelled together particularly well. Um, in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, Paul instructs the church at Ephesus to actually uh, work together in unity. And that is the context of what I'm saying today. It's about the body of Christ working together in unity uh, and being in that right relationship with God and with each other as well. Our salvation has a number of distinct phases. Um, I want to cover two of those today. The first of those is that when we hear the word of God, when we hear truth and respond to that, we are saved. But our salvation also requires a process of ongoing, uh, posh word, san sanctification. That means becoming more like God, more like Christ, and um, allowing that to be outworked in our lives. And that's where obedience comes in. And the context of our ongoing um, being made holy and like Christ is the church. That's where we become. We have our corners rubbed off. Next slide, please. So in verses uh, 20 to 24 of this chapter, we learn that Paul instructs the Ephesians about putting off our old self and putting on our new self. It's interesting. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, actually, there's an amazing change that happens when we commit our lives to Christ, when we give over control and let Christ take control, um, an amazing change spiritually takes place. And that's what Paul is talking about here, about putting off the old self and putting on the new self. So we've got to really understand, if we want to abide, we really need to understand what's happened to us we put our faith in Christ. <clears throat> we have to put on the new self and put on off our old self. So what are these old and new versions of ourselves? Um, well, we need to look back to the Old Testament, to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve to understand what these, our old self was. Next slide, please. Oh, that's a nice picture. <laughs> um, in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, it says, the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, 
But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, you will certainly die. Quite a familiar passage to us. God has spoken to um, Adam and Eve the truth there. They, he said, if you eat from that tree that I've forbidden you to eat, then you will surely die. That was the truth. However, Satan uh, attempts Eve to disobey and um, to rebel. And in Genesis 3 verse 4, we see that Satan lies to Eve and challenges what God says. Satan says, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be like God, knowing good and evil. He directly challenged the truth of the word of God and put doubt in Eve's mind about that truth. He's lied to her. So the basis of our salvation, our old self, is, is a lie. And when we become born again and new, we focus on the truth of God's word. So in saying you will not certainly die, he did lie and deceived. And back in Ephesians 3, in verse 22, it says, it makes it clear that our old selves are corrupted through deceitful desires. If you look back to the fall of man, uh, the process went like this. First came deception, the lie. Surely you won't die, questioning what God had said. And then came sin. Eve was tempted to eat apple and quickly followed suit. And then came death. So before that temptation and fall into sin, there was no death. We were eternal spiritual beings in total communion with God. And when we rebelled collectively, we rebelled against God. And unfortunately, that meant that we couldn't live eternally and we couldn't live in the way that God had intended. So our old selves, prior to salvation, are corrupt and disobedient and rebellious. I recognize all of that in myself. <laughs> um, uh, um, not only uh, before I got saved, but little bits of it creep back in very easily. And in doing so, if I give in to that, it's very hard to abide. But praise God for his mercy, because he's got a solution to this. Next slide, please. So what is God, God's solution for the old self? Well, first of all, let me tell you three things that it's not. And the first of those is it's nothing beginning with self. Actually, in the world, there's a massive amount of self-focused help stuff out there, isn't there? Self-fulfillment, self-help, um, uh, self self-discipline, self-expression. All of those things speak to our old selves, the old part of us that focuses on our needs, our wants, our desires. And that's not what our new lives are all about. The other thing that is that it doesn't require the law, and when we mean the law, we don't mean necessarily the law of this land, but the law, God's law, where in the Old Testament, people were required to, um, to follow strictly laws in order to gain access to God's presence. But when Jesus came, he broke the power of the law. He fulfilled the law. And we now say that we live under grace, God's grace. It's a new law, a law of freedom and grace. Um, so the law can't change the rebel. All it does is make us stick to the rules. And that doesn't fundamentally change us. And then there's religion. So it's not religion 
uh, that uh, actually is God's solution for our old selves. It's good to have the disciplines of prayer, reading scripture, serving, doing the stuff we do in church. But those things don't fundamentally deal with our old selves. You can go about the motions and not really, really be changed. A chap called Derek Prince, who I've taken some of this uh, sermon from, the, uh, one of my absolute uh, heroes of faith, he talks about religion being like a peach. And a peach, imagine our lives are like a peach. And a peach decays, doesn't it? No matter what you do with it, it will decay. If you put it in the fridge, it might take a bit longer to decay, but it still decays and dies eventually. So he says in our old selves, we are like those peaches. And when we come to church, if we haven't um, really put off our old selves and put on our new selves, we are like the peaches in the fridge and the church is the fridge. Sorry, Jeanette. <laughs> That's not saying that not all of those things aren't absolutely crucial. And when, when we're wearing that, our new selves, we want to do them. We want to pray. We want to serve. We want to love others. Uh, but that won't be the fundamental thing that changes our sinful human nature. So what is the solution Scarily, the solution is execution. <laughs> execution. See, the old self is, is, is a, like we heard last week, a rotting vine. And uh, Richard and uh, Andrea talk very uh, clearly about the need for our lives being like that rotting vine, to be cut down and removed, destroyed and burnt on the fire. You see, the good news is that execution has already taken place. We don't have to be executed because Christ has done it for us. In Romans 7, verses 24 and 25, it says, what a wretched man, woman, am I? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Well, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Romans 6, verse 6, it says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with and that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You see, that centre cross there was actually made for Barabbas. It wasn't Jesus' cross. It was made for a prisoner called Barabbas, who was a thief and a violent man and was in prison. But at the last minute, Pontius Pilate exchanged the prisoners and Jesus took Barabbas's place on that cross. We are Barabbas. We are thieves and liars in our old nature. We are the people who that cross was made for. But Jesus has taken our place. And every person who has ever lived and ever will live has the uh, opportunity to put to death them, their old selves and become new creations in Christ to deal with that sinful nature. So our, 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 synth, our new selves are born out of the truth of God's word. In Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10, it says, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old selves with, with its practice, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of Christ. So our new selves are progressively being renewed and the aim is twofold, to reflect God's likeness and to exercise his authority. How is this new self produced? It's produced through rebirth, spiritual rebirth, through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus is the living word of God. And when we hear the gospel, when we hear truth preached and we respond to that, 
we are given new lives, new spiritual lives that mean we become eternal beings. We are uncorruptible. The lying, rebellious nature of our old selves has been crucified with Christ. So we've got to deny the demands of our old self. We have to stop lying. We have to stop being rebellious and submit ourselves to the Spirit, which will result in truth and obedience. But all of that is done by the grace of God and not through our own hard effort. In Romans 12, it says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can attest and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and will. And that's so we can see, actually, who Christ really is and who our new selves are. We're changed under that law of grace, of liberty, And we must be transformed into the image of God. In John 3, it says, I must decrease so that he can increase. We have to put to death our old selves. Otherwise, there can't be any increase in Christ in our new selves. There's no room for it. So God's plan for our new self is twofold to be like God and to show his likeness. And um, uh, the, the verse in Genesis 1, 26, that's, that's what happens at the beginning of creation. That was God's original intention for us, that we would be like him and that we, he gave us authority on his behalf. Um, so that's what needs to be restored. So how do we... Uh, next slide, please. How do we apply this amazing truth to our own lives? So the old self is all about self. Um, It's self-centered in our minds. And our new self needs to become God-centered. In uh, the area of our emotions, we've got a big, strong focus on feelings. If it feels good, do it. I feel really rubbish today. The focus is on feelings. But in our new self, if we focus on God's will, our feelings kind of get put into place and sorted out. It's amazing how that happens. And when we think about our wills, we're dominated by desire. So we think about what we want. What is it I want out of life? Where am I going in my life? But in our new selves, we're controlled by the Holy Spirit. And we follow God's plan for our lives. Next slide, please. So in these old and new ways, in the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about three things in the body of Christ that are old ways and new ways. And he was clearly saying to the Ephesians, you're kind of slipping back into that old way of doing things. Don't do that. Don't get angry with people. And don't let that anger remain. Be forgiving, be loving. Because Christ has forgiven us and died for us. So why wouldn't we want to do that to others? And don't steal. Well, you might not think, well, I I don't rob any banks. I'm, I'm, I'm not a thief. But actually, do we steal a little bit at work, a little bit of time here and there? Do we steal from one another by not giving our time and our talents. Our our new selves require us to give generously. It's not about getting what you need and you want to fulfill your needs. It's about giving and generosity. And then Paul also instructs us not to engage in unwholesome talk. I call that gossip, and I hate gossip. He says, be kind and compassionate. The old self very easily falls into gossip and slander. But we need to encourage one another, build one another up. Be kind and compassionate. Next slide, please. So what clothes are we wearing today? Are we walking around in our, our, our new clothes? 
Or are we still wearing a few of the old stuff? See, if we don't change our clothes on a daily basis, we start to stink. Nobody wants to come near us. We have to get in that habit of every day putting those new clothes on. We have a whole new wardrobe available to us. Think about it when you get dressed in the morning. What are you putting on of your new self that day? And let the Holy Spirit in that process transform you. It doesn't happen overnight. It's an ongoing process. But it's not one you have to earn. The work has already been done. You just have to submit your life to God and let him transform you more and more into his likeness. And I'm just going to end up with a word of warning. Because if we don't do this, it won't turn out well for us. If we know the truth and we deliberately don't follow it, it won't turn out well. You see, in Revelation 2, uh, John wrote a letter um, to the church in Ephesus, another letter. And he said this, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you can't tolerate wicked people and that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So they've done some great stuff. They obviously, you know, took some of it on board. But then John says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So that habit of confessing and repenting taking off the old self, putting on the new self, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you in your walk with him on a daily basis to love God and to love each other is the key message. So where are you at today? You might not have um, got to that point where you've heard the truth and responded to the truth and had an initial experience of Um, of salvation and that may be your need today or you maybe have have had that experience but you've you've forgotten your first love you've forgotten to change those spiritual clothes every day and I think wherever you are today God is here and we're here to pray for anybody that would like prayer